Well, good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. All right, by a show of hands, I just want to know, who is waiting until after church to open all their presents? Oh, wow. Impressive. Okay, you can put your hands down. Who, who has opened maybe just their stocking or maybe a present or two before the service, but most of them are waiting until after? That's our family. Yeah, very nice. Santa, very good. And then, by a show of hands, who has already done all of Christmas morning, opened all your presents? Oh, 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 oh. look at all you heathens. <laughs> just kidding. One of my daughters asked me earlier this week, she was like, Dad, how can we still love Jesus on, on Christmas morning and not just be thinking about our presence all the time? And I thought that was a really good, a really good question. I think one way that we love Jesus um, isn't just by like ignoring our presence, but by giving thanks for them, right? And by being grateful. And so I am so grateful that we're able to be here as a church family on this morning. What a cool thing. I, w- I kind of wish it was every Sunday or every, every year that we did this. Um, it just feels really, really special. Uh, Let's stand together. We're going to read from the the first letter of John as we open our service, and then we're going to have someone come up and read Scripture. We have a couple families who are involved in this this morning. Um, So, River, if you want to get to your spot, I'll give you your microphone. But let's all read this just out loud together. This is 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be. O oh, come, all ye faithful. Behold him. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. It should be on. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
Therefore, the child will be born called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month of, with her who has, was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Good morning. Merry Christmas. I'm reading from Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered yeah, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn.
And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I give you good news of great joy, that be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what they had or wonder what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Take your seats. All right, how about now? There it is. Merry Christmas, you filthy animals. <laughs> you ready for that? I am now the hero to my granddaughter, Eliana. Wow, so good to see you today. I like Christmas. I agree with Josh. I like Christmas on Sunday morning. Uh, 11 years until I think it, I think it's 11 years until it'll happen again uh, due to leap years and things like that. So, um, so normally the, the fourth Sunday of every month, or every, yeah, of every month, we go over to the cluster homes, which are a, a group of homes for uh, severely disabled adults. Um, and we do a worship service there. Uh, this morning, it's just too cold, um, and so we are not going to go over there after the service. Um, uh, even We thought, well, we'll just do some Christmas caroling, but uh, there are some that are just not feeling really well, and to have them stand there with their door open is, is it's not really kind on our part. Uh, and so we do have a group over. I know there's some of you that are just faithfully that, faithful to go over every, every month. And so if that's you and you want to be a part, we, we have some gifts for, for them and for some of the staff. And so Pam Lusher, immediately after our service, will actually go over to do that. And if you want to join her for that, then, then that's a great opportunity um, for you to do that as well. Uh, also, um, this, um, uh, and so some of the songs that we were going to do over there, we, I asked Josh if he would incorporate here uh, right after the welcome. And so we'll do that uh, together, some, some just traditional Christmas carols uh, together. So... 
Uh, I just learned a few minutes ago that we've got uh, some treats for some kids after the service. Uh, if you stay awake the whole time, um, then there's a prize for you. Now, there's some balloon animals uh, that uh, somebody's coming and is, is making for the kids. So after the service, though, that'll be available. Um, next Sunday, if you guys would just cut me off for just a second for the live stream. Farty will come and, and transition us back to, uh, to Genesis, and then we'll go back to our, our normal schedule. So um, if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, if you would, take a minute. There's a, there's a visitor's card in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you would fill that out, you can give it to me at the end of the service, or uh, we have a tithe and offering box there in the back. You can put it there as well. Um, but let's take a few minutes and uh, wish those who have come to worship alongside of us uh, Merry Christmas this morning.
We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Good tidings to bring to you and your kin. Good tidings for Christmas and a Happy New Year. Do you this one? We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Happy New Year! Very nice, buddy. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Evie. All right, kids, you can go back to your spot. So one of the beautiful things that we get to do today, buddy, thank you, is jump on Dad's piano. No, um, is have Miss Sarah Beth Todd come and play piano for us. She's going to lead us a little bit. And, uh, and her granddaughter, Mackenzie, will play flute. As we prepare our hearts for worship uh, and receiving God's word this morning, what, what a nice thing that we get to, I mean, seriously, like, to actually gather together and to um, let the word of Christ resonate in us as a group. Uh, we're going to prepare our hearts by singing uh, a song we usually don't sing because we usually don't have a nighttime service at CBC, but we're going to sing Silent Night.
I thought maybe I was supposed to wait another song out. Our text this morning is from Matthew chapter 1. As we pray this morning, I'm going to read that text. Let's pray together. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken of, or spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Father, this morning we celebrate the birth of our Savior. One who left heaven, who incarnated himself into the womb of a virgin named Mary. Was born as we were, but lived the life that we couldn't live. And then died the death that we deserve. Really, that's the message of Christmas. And so, Father, we thank you for the gospel message. We pray this morning, as I know many have unwrapped gifts, and this is such a big deal for presents and lights and things like that, uh, that we would keep at the forefront of our minds the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And so help me this morning to work through this passage so that the saints of God are equipped, and so that the lost will hear the gospel and be saved. So we thank you for our time. We love you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Christmas Day. I love Christmas. I am the the Christmas guy. I mean, I I love the presents. Actually, I was really disappointed that none of the kids and grandkids were going to be waking us up at 3.30 to you know, to do presents. I, I just so enjoy that side of Christmas. And, and my kids are all old now. And they don't like that stuff anymore. And they want to sleep in and make their hair nice and everything else before church. And, uh, and so we're going to do the whole doing church and then we're going to go home and make lunch first. And then we're going to open presents. So anyway, that is not my choice, but that's what we're doing. Um, <laughs> You know, it's funny, we, we, I've said for years, I, I, I always have a Christmas list. And I keep a running list on my phone in my notes section. And, uh, and, and people go, that's, that's kind of presumptuous, isn't it? I mean, what are you doing there? And, and I said, you know, for years, I, I, I tell my kids, they say, what do you want for Christmas? And I say, nothing. Like, I, I'm completely fine. I, I don't want anything for Christmas. And then they'd get me something. But it wasn't something I necessarily wanted. And so I thought, you know what? If they're going to get me something anyway, let me make a list. And so I just keep a running list on my phone. I'll, maybe I'll be store like, oh, that'd be kind of cool to have. And I'll just kind of put that on there. And, and, and a Jeep and a Corvette is always on there. But <laughs> I, for some reason, I don't get either one of those. Uh, I get like shop pencils and things like that. Um, and, but it's, it's wonderful. So Uh, I so enjoy just the whole Christmas season. Honestly, it's one of the best times for me of the year. But I know and recognize that it really, it it carries all kinds of emotions. Some of you guys are probably like me. And and, and there's, I'm sure there's homes where uh, some of you guys like slept in front of the tree last night. That's what Adam used to do. He'd sleep in front of the tree on on Christmas Eve. and, And some of you guys didn't get any sleep last night, right? You tossed and turned all night. Of course, you toss and turn every night, so it wasn't any different than any of the other nights you have, right? 
but Christmas is, is really wonderful. I love it. But I recognize for others that's not true. You know, some of you guys in here this morning are, are celebrating the first Christmas with a new baby or a new marriage, uh, which is just really cool. And so this makes this Christmas season really special. Others are, are sorrowful is because, because this is the first Christmas that they've had without a loved one. And so there's really mixed emotions on this day. You know, probably much like, I would say, that original, the first Christmas day. I mean, imagine that season, being Mary and Joseph, traveling, nine months pregnant, trying to find a place to sleep, suddenly labor pains start hitting, and there's no rooms, nothing's available for them. You know, we've read the Magnificat uh, this Advent season. You know what that word means, that Magnificat? I don't know that we ever really talk about that. It's, it's a Latin term, and it, and it means my soul magnifies the Lord. And so it's really a message of hope. And so every week, I've so appreciated, Josh has been reading uh, from that every week. And it's a message that says that, that we have hope because we have a deliverer who has come. And, and, and so it seems to me that that Christians tend to land on one end of the spectrum or the other as it relates to Mary, right? On one, on one side, we see Mary as, as worthy of worship. We see her as sinless and a perpetual virgin who answers our prayers and helps us in our redemption. Because that's one side. The other side completely ignores her. Anytime you get on either end of those spectrums, it's, it's going to be wrong. But I would say in some ways that first Christmas is probably really similar to some of your Christmas seasons. You think Mary was stressed and overwhelmed? No doubt. I bet she couldn't wait to get this baby delivered and, and move forward and move on to whatever the new normal would be. And so in Mary's part of the Christmas story, we, what we see is God sovereignly working through her. He supernaturally opened her womb to conceive and then to carry and to give birth to the promised Messiah. And when I say promise, I mean, it goes back. We've been studying through the book of Genesis, right? We saw it in Genesis, Genesis 3, verse 15, that the Messiah would come through the seed of a woman, which is really a reference to the virgin birth. Isaiah 7, look at it. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. What would be the sign? Well, behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so God fulfilled these prophecies, and we, we celebrate his birth, and, and we do it on, Jan, on December 25th, but not around the world. In fact, the Orthodox calendar does it on a different day. We celebrate December 25th. What is the Orthodox calendar? What day do they celebrate it? January 7th. January 7th. And so we have a number of Ukrainians in here this morning who are going to get December 25th Christmas and then January 7th Christmas. Kind of the best of both worlds, right? But we don't really know what day uh, Jesus was born. But we can be really sure that it wasn't December 25th or January 7th. You know why? Because shepherds wouldn't have been out in the fields at night in the middle of winter. And so the stories that you see that surround Jesus' family are filled with controversy. You think about Mary, her reputation was stained. She was seen as a, a, a woman who was pregnant outside of marriage. Joseph was mocked. And then Jesus himself was hung on a cross like a common criminal. And yet God always seems to work through ways that we wouldn't imagine. When we think about the birth of Jesus, it's the seed of the woman, it's it's through Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. And you would think that the Messiah would come through the hero's son, right? Joseph, who ultimately uh, saved the whole uh, nation. But it doesn't go through Joseph. It goes through Judah. And then he's going to sit on David's throne and born in Bethlehem. He's going to be from Nazareth. And what was the question that was asked of Nazareth? Does anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, the star the wise men saw, that was miraculous. The family fleeing to Egypt, that was supernatural. And now what we've done is we've taken Christmas to be about Santa bringing presents to every good boy and girl. I, I love presents. But it's so much more than that. 
In fact, when I think of Christmas, I just think, wow, what a great opportunity to rejoice. I I told Josh I wanted our Christmas service to be filled with singing because that's the response that you see at the first Christmas. How did the angels announce his birth? They sang, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. And then it says the shepherds, they ran to the manger and they left. And what does it say? Glorifying and praising God. But what about Mary? Look at Luke, Luke 1. Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. It's just a consistent thing that you see in the scriptures is Christmas is an opportunity to rejoice. And so we take Mary and say, well, she's either sinless or she's no big deal. And I think it's somewhere in the middle. Jesus' mom. One of the last things Jesus said on the cross was telling John to take care of his mom. Jesus thought highly of his mom. He had a special place in his heart for his mom. She's blessed among women. God supernaturally opened her womb. In fact, the whole Christmas story is miraculous. And it's tempting, I think, for all of us to get wrapped up and kind of lost in the familiarity of the story and lose what God wants us to learn from his word. And so his earthly life began really similar to how ours began at conception. Look at verse 18. We're just going to work through this. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now there's a few things that are significant here. The first one is obvious. Mary was with child. Child, not a clump of cells, not a fetus, a child. A couple times in this passage, it calls Jesus a child while he's still in the womb. Now, what's not so obvious is the fact that Mary and Joseph were betrothed to be married. In fact, it was interesting. It was one of the readings earlier today. I don't know if you caught it, but the reader said betrothed and the screen said engaged. Okay, betrothal and engagement are different. Okay, it, it may be the closest thing we have, but, but it's more than that. To be betrothed to somebody is to be married to them. You're actually, it's a legal thing. You're actually considered husband and wife, but the marriage hadn't been consummated yet. In fact, look at verse 19. And Joseph, it says, what's he called? What's it call her? Her husband. So he was called her husband, even though they weren't married. Again, different than engagement. We would say fiance. Now, the only thing, again, this was a legal uh, uh, binding here. The only thing that could break off betrothal was some tor- sort of sexual immorality. So Joseph had within his rights, right, to be able to, to put Mary away. And so look as, as he's pondering, verse 19. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Okay, Joseph, her husband, again, that's significant, being a righteous man. In other words, he, he had the right to disgrace her. He had the right to send her away secretly. In fact, Joseph had the right to, to have Mary publicly stoned to death. But you know, this really goes in from last week's sermon. Remember we talked about how, how Jesus emptied himself. He considered others as more important than himself. He he gave up his rights. And now it says Joseph was a righteous man. How do we know that Joseph was a righteous man? He gave up his rights. Look at verse 20. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of Mary, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Did I say son of Mary? Sorry. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. (coughs) And I'm thinking, can you imagine the conversation Joseph has with his friends? Hey, I I heard a rumor. I just wanted to ask you about it. Is it true that, that Mary's pregnant? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, 
Why would you do that? No, 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 it, it wasn't me. Oh, you're not the dad. No, I'm not the dad. Well, who's the dad? God is. How do you know that? An angel told me. Now imagine having that conversation. I mean, we look back and we, and we celebrate because we, we know the end, right? We look back and we celebrate this pregnancy. We celebrate the birth. But, but have you even considered how much bullying would have been, would have been involved here? Not, not just for Mary, but for Joseph. And certainly for Jesus. Look what, remember when Jesus was rebuking the, the religious leaders? John 8, look at verse 41. Jesus says this. You are doing the deeds of your father, talking about the devil, okay? The, 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 you religious leaders are doing the deeds of the devil, your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication like you were. We have one father, God. You know what this tells me? Everybody knew. So we celebrate this virgin birth, and they were criticized for it. And I know in our world, they say, oh, the virgin birth isn't a big deal. Listen, it's a huge deal. It has huge implications. It's one of those things that we would say is a tight-fisted issue of the church. In fact, all of history is impacted by the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. If he wasn't born a virgin, then he would have a sin nature. And if he had a sin nature, then he would have had to have sinned. And so let's look at who Jesus was. Point number one, if you're taking notes, is he was truly human. When God became a man, number one, he was truly human. Luke 2, verse 7, it says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It's really one of the important verses about the humanity of Jesus. Why did Mary wrap him in cloths? I mean, does God get cold? He can't get cold. He's God. Why'd she lay him in a manger? Well, because he was like other babies. He couldn't stand on his own. He was cooped up for months inside of Mary. So she comforts him by, by wrapping him close. I mean, he was a helpless baby just like we were. Surprise for all my Facebook friends. He didn't have a halo over his head. Neither did his mom or his dad. All wasn't calm and all wasn't bright. He was wrapped in swaddling clothing and then he soiled those clo that clothing. Mary had to change God's diapers. Have you ever thought about that? So in every way, he was a baby. Do you think he cried and fussed when he was teething? Yeah. You think he always had a beard? No, he's probably like 13 and, and he's got this little peach fuds, you know, kind of coming in, maybe a little mustache. And he's going, hey, 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 when, if, if the sun hits this just right, can you see a little peach fuzz? He was human. And, and listen, I know there are churches that, that, that are making, trying to make an argument that Jesus isn't God. Like, that's not us. We don't try to make that argument. We understand he is truly God. You know what our danger is? Is we forget his humanity. But, but if, if we're going to understand our humanity, then we under, have to understand his humanity. He grew up like we did. He may have had pimples and acne. He had to go to school. He learned to obey his parents. He learned how to get along with imperfect brothers. Can you imagine that conversation? Why can't you be more like Jesus? Duh. 100% man and 100% God. Now, now think about this. This is an interesting thing. There are some things that are true of Jesus that are not true of the Father. And this is part of the, the mystery that, that really blows our minds. Like, I'm not questioning his, 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 his deity. I just want to highlight his humanity just for a minute. So point A is, things that were true of him but not true of the Father is, A is he was seen. You could see him. John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So God the Father is invisible. 
No one has seen God at any time, but 11 verses later, John 1, 29, it says, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He saw him. Colossians 1, 15, look what Paul says. He's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. Jesus would go on to tell his followers, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so one of the things that's true of Jesus that's not true of God the Father is that Jesus is is visible. The second one, B, is Jesus was tempted. Now James says that God can't be tempted. But God is truly human could be, right? James 1.13 Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. He himself does not tempt anyone. In his deity, it's impossible for him to be tempted. In his humanity, it's realistic. Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Why? To be tempted by the devil. In his humanity, he was tempted. In fact, he was tempted in the same way we are. So he gets it. Like he understands our temptation. Hebrews 4 verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are. Yet without sin. So he was tempted and he was tempted in all things just like us. So he was tempted with the lust of the flesh. He was tempted with the lust of the eyes. He was tempted with the pride of life. The difference between us and him is he never gave in. The next thing, what's true of Jesus that's not true of the Father? Point C is he grew in wisdom. You know, one of the requirements of being God is that you know everything. Nothing's new, nothing is new to God. I love this saying, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? Nothing. Like God's not surprised. Anything that happens in your life, God's not going, oh no, what do we do now? We do that. He didn't do that. 1 John, verse 3, he says, In whatever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. How much does God know? Everything. Don't you wonder, did Jesus know everybody's thoughts at all times? I mean, was he laying there as a baby thinking, Mama thinks I have a dirty diaper, but I'm just hungry. She just doesn't get it. Was he laying there just processing these thoughts all the time? The answer is no. He emptied himself of those things. And so Luke 2, verse 52, it says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So he was born a baby, needing what babies need. And then as he grew up, he learned new things. And although he was perfect, he wasn't the know-it-all kid. He just grew. Everybody was surprised. And the last one, D, is he died. He's different than the father. And so the Christmas story is a story of a little baby that came to die. You go, but God can't die. (laughs) He's eternal. That's what Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy 6. He says, he who is blessed and the only sovereign, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality. God is immortal. He has eternal dominion. And yet the baby, he came as a baby in order to die. And die he did. John 19, verse 32. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So God is immortal, but Jesus died. Listen, I am in no way suggesting, even in the slightest bit, that Jesus was not God. He was God, he is God, and he was human. He was a man, he was truly human. And point number two is he's truly God. So how can he be God and not do what God does? How can I sit here and and speak about Jesus being human and at the same time talk about him being God? 
Like how, how, does, how does that work? Really, we read a lot of it last week. So point number one is he emptied himself. He emptied himself. Remember last week, Philippians 2, verse 6, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant being made in the likeness of men. He emptied himself. He emptied himself of his rights as God when he took on human flesh. He, he took on those limitations that you and I live with. Like he willingly did that. And so he emptied himself. And the second one, B, here is he entrusted himself. Remember when the disciples were troubled and, and, and Philip asked Jesus, he says, show us the Father. Would you, do, would you show us the Father? Look at Jesus' response, John 14. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Why? Because the work is the Father's work. And the Father did his work through the Son. And so now the, the miraculous life that Jesus lived was the, was the result of him entrusting himself to the Father. That's why he could do some things that, that seem so unexplainable and so foreign to us, doesn't it? First Peter 2, look what Peter says. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. Wow. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to, want, to him who judges righteously. Jesus only did what was the will of the Father. And then the Father did his work through him. And we could go on and on and on and on about the deity of Christ. I like John 10, 27 to 30. He said, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. How do we know who the sheep of God are? Is it because they have all the right answers to the questions about salvation? Nope. Is it because they've walked that aisle and prayed that prayer and went to VBS and did all those things? Nope. My sheep, Jesus says, hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And then he says, and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, now you talk to a lot of people, especially the cults, and you, you give them this verse and they say, well, he didn't mean one in, in essence. He just meant one in purpose. So the Father wants to see people saved. The Son wants people saved. Right? The Father wants, to do, wants, people to do, wants you to do good works. The Son wants you to do good works. So they're not one in, in, in essence. They're one in purpose. And they'll say the same thing like, well, when you're married, you know, you're, you're considered one, but you're not really one. You're, you're two. And so you have to ask, well, how did these people see that? Is that what they understood as well? So Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And then look at the next verse. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? And the Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. He didn't leave this as an open-ended option for us. It's not one in purpose, although they are one in purpose, it's one in essence. So he says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So they understood, the original audience understood, when Jesus was making this claim, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me, I give eternal life to them, no one will snatch them out of my hand, my Father who's greater than all, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand, I and the Father are one. When they knew, when he said that, this is the carpenter's son from Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, who has just made the claim to be God.
And this claim is what got him crucified. And which has huge application for us. What does Christmas mean for us? Well, he were, if he were just God and not a man, well, he couldn't relate to us and couldn't die for us. If he were just man and not God, well, he couldn't be sinless and then die for us. So practically speaking, what does this mean in our application? Number one is we're going to do greater works. Greater works. And Jesus just explained how he was able to do the works he did. And he, he attributed the work to the Father working in him. But look what he says to Philip and ultimately to us. John 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. And so the explanation for Jesus' life is that he only did the will and the work of the Father. You know, we, we talk about this all the time. Like, I do what I do because I want what I want, right? I do what I do because I want what I want. What if all I wanted to do was please God? What if all I wanted to do was obey God? Jesus really lived out the life that God intended for us Christians to live. And then he promised that, that our work would be greater. And we think, well, how can that be? I mean, you think about all that he did. But listen, Jesus limited his deity to his humanity. And so if, if, if we wanted Jesus in Florida, but he was in Galilee, we don't get him. But then he left his spirit to live in each of us so that wherever we go, he's with us. He's with us, he's ready to work in us, he's ready to work through us. And so he took on human flesh, they laid him in a manger, and he grew in wisdom, he got tired, he sat down, he rested, he wept, he got hungry, he bled, he felt pain, he suffered, and he died. Why? Because he's human. And so the explanation for his life was to demonstrate for each one of us what it really truly means to live as God intended us to live. And so this promise of greater works is not limited to the apostles. It's really a promise to all of us who would submit our lives and live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus died for us so that we would die to ourselves. And number two, we have equal righteousness. The beauty of the Christmas story is that this little baby, when he died, he exchanged his righteousness for our sin. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's why every believer in the word of God is called a saint. It's the greatest exchange, right? We give him our sin, he gives us his righteousness. So we can never use the excuse anymore, I'm only human. The gospel, the good news is that Jesus, who lived the sacrificial or sinless life, died a sacrificial death for sin. But it doesn't end there. Three days after he died, he rose from death. And now he lives in every one of us believers. And now with Christ in us, we can do what Christ did with the Father in him. In other words, we can display Jesus just like Jesus displayed the Father. You know, we're going to sing in a few minutes. I thought it was last week. It was this week. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Truly human. Truly God. Wrapped up in one. Let's pray together. You know, the question that you'd have to ask is simply, are you in Christ? Has your sins been exchanged for his righteousness? Has that been demonstrated in you? One, that you hear God's voice, and two, that you follow him. Father, I pray for those in here this morning. This Christmas day, I can't imagine a better gift than to receive Christ as their Lord and their Savior.
God, not only have you given us Christ, but then you've promised to work in our lives in such a way that we would become more like him. And so I pray for the church. I pray that as a result of us spending time together, that we would be more like Christ. That we would encourage one another and love one another this morning. That we would care for one another and exhort one another. That others would would see our love for one another and ultimately come to, to glorify you, our Father who's in heaven. And so, Father, take this time of worship. Be pleased with it. Thank you that we can come to the throne of grace with confidence because of who Christ is. Thank you for the message of the gospel, not just for the unsaved, but for the saved. Thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand together. We've got a couple of songs I know for sure we're going to sing. And um, man, what a great opportunity this is for us.
So those of us who follow Jesus and those of us who are not following Jesus yet, we can have this similar wondering or question, if I follow Jesus, is that just going to turn me into one of those crazy people who are radical, right? There's some crazy Christians out there in the world. But the truth is, if you do follow Jesus, you will be radical. You'll be radically humble, radically loving, radically generous. All the things that we see in Christ when he is truly man and truly God and we are following him, his righteousness is imputed upon us. We are made day by day more in his image and his likeness. And so when you see in the Christmas stories people being humble, people being generous, people being kind, that's a mirror of who Christ is. It's a mirror of who Christ is. And as Paul writes in the book of Philippians, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it on the day of Christ Jesus, the day of the Lord. So my friends, brothers and sisters, Merry Christmas. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.